Russia's elite have long viewed Austria as the best of both worlds. A gateway to the West, yet not fully Western. Vienna with its faded imperial splendor, pliant politicians and famed cozy cordiality is a traditional favorite of oligarchs and apparatchiks alike. Above all, it's a place where Russians with money and influence have been welcomed, whether they want to acquire citizenship or purchase real estate in the Alps. And even now, in the face of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, not much seems to be changing, as Austria appears to be reluctant to cut its ties and supplies with Moscow. The fear in Brussels is that over time, the emergence of a Russia tolerant zone at the geographic heart of Europe could give Russia the upper hand. So how did Austria lose its empire and become neutral? When did its business relationship with Russia begin? And will Austria maintain its neutral position in the future? Let's roll. The roots of the Austrian empire trace back to the house of Habsburg, one of the most influential royal houses in Europe that reigned since the Middle Ages. At their height, the Habsburgs ruled the Holy Roman Empire, as well as Spain, Portugal and their colonies. However, the Thirty Years' War, the Nine Years' War and the War of the Spanish Succession would prevent the Habsburgs from centralizing the Holy Roman Empire under their rule. And at the same time, it would relinquish their hold over Spain and Portugal. In the early 19th century, following Napoleon Bonaparte's dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, the Austrian Empire was proclaimed under the Emperor Francis II. This empire encompassed a multi-ethnic and multilingual population, including Germans, Czechs, Hungarians, Poles and many others. The revolutions of 1848, which swept across Europe, brought liberal and nationalist demands from the empire's diverse nationalities, leading to a period of political reorganization. So the Compromise of 1868, or the Auschwitz, transformed the Austrian Empire into the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary, granting the Kingdom of Hungary equal status with the Austrian part of the empire. Austria-Hungary was geographically the second largest in Europe and the third most populous. It also built up the fourth largest machine building industry in the world and it constructed Europe's second largest railway network. Vienna became a vibrant center of literature, music and the arts. However, despite these developments, the empire was plagued by national tensions amongst its various ethnic groups. The dual monarchy system was increasingly seen as favoring the Austrian and Hungarian groups. This would ultimately lead to its downfall after the conclusion of the First World War. Austria is one of the main parties to have sparked the First World War due to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne by a Serbian nationalist in June 1914. Austria-Hungary, believing that the Serbian government was involved in the assassination, issued an ultimatum to Serbia with extremely harsh terms. Serbia's response was deemed unsatisfactory, leading to Austria-Hungary to declare war. This set off a chain reaction of alliances throughout Europe escalating the conflict into a full-scale war. Austria-Hungary fought on multiple fronts against Russia, against Italy, Serbia, France and Britain. Austria's diplomatic efforts were heavily influenced by Germany as it found itself increasingly dependent on its more powerful ally, both militarily and economically. By the end of the war, the once powerful Austro-Hungarian Empire disintegrated as the map of Central Europe was redrawn, resulting in the loss of over 60% of Austria-Hungary's pre-war territory and more than 50% of its population. The Republic of Austria was established on November 12, 1918. Austria now found itself a small, landlocked country of about 6.5 million people, with 4 million Austrian Germans excluded from the new state and instead being placed against their declared will under Czechoslovak, Italian and Yugoslav rule. Vienna, with its population of almost 2 million, was left as an imperial capital without an empire to feed it. Austria was also forbidden from being absorbed into Germany by the League of Nations. 
much of the German-speaking population of Austria believed that the country was no longer economically and politically viable. As a result, the post-war period saw a significant erosion of democratic rights, particularly under the coalition of the Christian Social Party and the paramilitary Heimwehr. This coalition, formed in the late 1920s, aimed to prevent the Social Democrats from gaining power. Their rule ushered in an era of authoritarianism, marked by the promotion of a classless, corporatist state. The 1929 stock market crash in the United States hit Austria's economy, which was already struggling in the post-war period. Unemployment soared, and social and economic disparities widened. This further exacerbated the political instability. As Adolf Hitler came into power in Germany in 1933, the wish for Austria to merge with Germany was also revived. This was mainly due to the Nazis' Heimins Reich plan. This concept aimed to integrate as many ethnic Germans living outside Germany into a greater Germany. Just a year prior, in 1932, Engelbert Dolfus was appointed Chancellor of Austria amidst the country's deepening crisis. His policies were rooted in an ideology known as Austrofascism, a unique form of authoritarian governance that sought to establish a corporatist state and suppress socialist and democratic forces, while fiercely resisting unification with Germany. Dolfus, along with his successor, Kurt Schuschnigg, were staunchly opposed to Anschluss, a union with Hitler's Germany. Dolfus's regime had a distinctive stance on preserving the Catholic and rural traditions of Austria, viewing these as bulwarks against the spread of national socialism. However, the Austro-Fascist dictatorship was short-lived. In 1934, Dolfus was assassinated during a failed coup attempt by Austrian Nazis to seize control of the Austrian government and pave the way for Anschluss. These pictures, rushed to Britain from Vienna, show vividly the state of desperate crisis through which Austria has been passing. The strongholds in which the Schutzbund, or Socialist Defence League, hold out are huge blocks of flats built for the Viennese workers by the Socialist Council of the city. Here, the Socialists and Communists, suspicious of the dictatorship of Dr. Dolfus, have secreted guns and ammunition for the coup d'etat which they feared. Undoubtedly, large numbers have perished in the fighting. Various estimates are given. The socialist casualties on the first day are known to have included 1,500 dead. In early 1938, under increasing pressure from pro-unification activists, Kurt Schusnick announced that there would be a referendum on a possible union with Germany, versus maintaining Austria's sovereignty to be held on 13th March. Portraying this as defying the popular will in Austria and Germany, Hitler threatened an invasion and secretly pressured Schusnick to resign. A day before the planned referendum on 12th of March, the German army crossed the border into Austria. The federal state of Austria would soon become a part of the German Reich, as its people did not have the determination or conviction to fight off the invaders. In fact, the German military mostly received enthusiastic support and welcome. Few knew the kind of tragedy which this would result in and what was about to be unleashed upon the world. Despite mostly fervent support, a section of Austrians vehemently opposed the Nazi occupation, giving birth to resistance movements, spearheaded by Heinrich Meyer, a Catholic priest. Meyer's group carved out an indispensable niche within the resistance landscape by passing vital intelligence concerning German inventions such as the V-1 and V-2 rocket programs, the Tiger tank and the Messerschmitt BF-109, as well as the locations where these items were being manufactured, leading to multiple successful bombing operations for the Allies. While some Austrians resisted, 950,000 Austrians fought for the German armed forces. A large number of the people who were responsible for carrying out the final solution, or the planned genocide of Jews, were from Austria. In fact, it's estimated that while Austrians made up about 8% of Nazi Germany's population, they were overrepresented in the SS, the main organization responsible for the crimes against Jews. And the staff of concentration camps were mostly Austrian. Following the cessation of global hostilities, 
Austria found itself in a similar situation as did Germany. Is partitioned among the four occupying powers into French, American, British, and Soviet zones. And Vienna, like Berlin, Germany, and the Austrian nation, is also divided among the key members of the Soviet and Western blocs, each country occupying a section of the ancient capital city. And in the center of the city itself lies an area controlled jointly by the four powers, the international zone. This partitioning, which lasted from 1945 to 1955, was a direct result of the Potsdam Agreement and was intended to facilitate the denazification and democratization of Austria. But unlike Germany, which came to be divided into two in 1949, Austria would be reunited in full in 1955, with the Austrians being forced to become a militarily neutral power. The partitioning period significantly influenced Austria's post-war identity and its international relations, shaping its commitment to neutrality and peace. Following the re-establishment of Austria as an independent nation, its people would face the difficult task of figuring out a new identity, as union with Germany was made illegal by its constitution. The new Austria would adopt the basis of its culture, victimhood, as the first nation to be occupied by the Nazis. The natural beauty of its mountainous landscape and its diplomatic neutrality. This cultural reinvention would prove to be successful, as these three central pillars proved attractive for the generation that had endured the Second World War. The nation swiftly transitioned from its troubling past, embracing a fresh identity and reaping the benefits of diplomatic neutrality during the Cold War unlike Germany, which was forced to confront and reconcile with its wartime actions. Austria was permitted to sidestep its past. For example, the Freedom Party of Austria, a party with ties to former fascists and Nazis, gained significant traction and is still one of the leading political powers in Austria today. This rebranding of Austria became so successful that the movie The Sound of Music, released in 1965, captured nearly perfectly the image of Austria as a beautiful country of mountains that the main characters had to flee to escape the Nazi occupation. Also, during the shooting of the movie, the city of Salzburg didn't want to permit the filmmakers to hang Nazi flags as props. It took the threat by the filmmakers of using real footage of the city welcoming Hitler to force the city to stand down from its demands. Austria would further attempt to embrace its rich cultural past through the celebration of Austrian artists such as Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert and others. Interestingly, in 1968, Austria became the first Western European country to begin imports of natural gas from the Soviet Union. Austria's neutrality between NATO and the Soviet bloc was beginning to look quite profitable. It was a fairly major step considering the existing tensions during the Cold War. As the Cold War came to an end and the need for neutrality would diminish, Austria's identity would once again face a shift. The promise of economic benefits would push Austria to join the European Union in 1995, while in 2000 the chairman of the Social Democrats apologized for his country's anti-Semitism and the wooing of former Nazis. It seemed like a new age was dawning on Austria. When Russia attacked Ukraine on February 24th, many might have assumed Austria's reaction to mirror that of other EU nations, with the exception of Hungary, whose anti-EU sentiments and favourable opinions of Russia were well known. Even Switzerland's and Serbia's responses, two other neutral countries, were supportive of Ukraine. The most surprising response, however, came from Austria. While before the war, most countries in the EU imported a majority of their natural gas from Russia, many have drastically cut their reliance on it since the start of the war. In contrast, Austria has proven its promises of reducing Russian gas to be quite hollow. Austria has only seen a slight decline in its imports, dropping from 80% in 2022 to some 60%. Austria speaks of supporting Ukraine, yet it simultaneously finds it difficult to stop paying Moscow for its gas. While Austria supports the European Union's sanctions on Russia, it is also not sending any weapons to Kyiv. However, it does allow arms shipments intended for Ukraine to traverse its territory. At the same time, numerous Austrian businesses maintain ongoing commercial relationships with Russia. 
and business seems to be taking precedence over European security, mostly because of long-standing contracts and interpersonal relationships. This relationship could be well seen in 2014, shortly after Russia's annexation of Crimea, when Putin was warmly received in Vienna. This visit coincided with the establishment of a lucrative gas deal between Austria and Russia, which significantly benefited the then state-owned energy group, OMV, which currently has a contract with Gazprom that is only set to expire in 2040. OMV plans to continue importing the majority of its natural gas from Russia, as the EU's Russian energy sanctions do not currently apply to gas. This means that even though there are calls for Austria to reduce its dependence, the country is bound by the terms of the contract. Hence, most of Austria's gas is likely to keep coming from Russia for the foreseeable future. Even Ukraine still has an ongoing contract which permits Russian gas to arrive in Europe, with Austria being one of the main destinations through the Soyuz pipeline. Ukraine's contract is however set for expiration in 2024, and if it isn't renewed, Austria might not even be able to receive Russian gas any longer. Russia remains the second largest investor in Austria after Germany, a position it has held since 2014, with foreign direct investment totaling 25 billion euro in 2022. In comparison, US invested in Austria a total of 13 billion, while those of neighboring Italy are about 11 billion. Meanwhile, hundreds of Austrian companies that invested in Russia in recent years remain active. An intricate web of relationships has been woven between the Austrian and Russian political elite over the years. Notably, many former Austrian chancellors have sought professional opportunities in Russia after their tenure. Wolfgang Schussel, for instance, joined the boards of Russian telecommunication operator MTS and oil giant Lukoil while Alfred Gusenbauer found employment in the pro-Russian think tank Dialogue of Civilizations Research Institute. Christian Kern, on the other hand, secured a position on the board of the Russian State Railway. One of the most publicized instances was that of former foreign minister Karin Knessel, who not only invited Putin to her wedding and shared a dance with him, but also joined the board of the Russian state-owned oil company Rosneft and became a regular contributor on Russian television. Thus, we could argue that this transactional diplomacy has fostered corruption and increasingly poses a threat to European security. For example, the Wirecard scandal, considered to be one of the largest financial frauds in history. Wirecard was a German digital payment firm that claimed to process transactions for consumers and businesses. However, it was discovered that a staggering 1.9 billion was missing from its accounts, leading to its insolvency in June 2020. Jan Marcelik, the company's chief operating officer, was implicated in the scandal. However, he managed to dodge the legal consequences by escaping to Russia. What made this escape even more intriguing was the alleged involvement of former Austrian intelligence operatives, raising questions about the integrity and credibility of Austria's intelligence services. There are instances where Austria appears to prioritize its own interests over those of the European Union. A case in point is Austria's veto of Romania's Schengen membership. Despite Romania meeting all the prescribed criteria for accessing it, Austria has consistently blocked its entry. The timing of Austria's veto is intriguing as it coincides with reports of Austrian corporations engaging in illegal logging activities in Romanian forests. This has led to speculation that Austria's veto is motivated less by concerns about Romania's readiness and more by a desire to protect its own economic interests. While these incidents do not necessarily reflect the entirety of Austria's approach to EU relations, they do highlight some of the complexities and contradictions. Where Austria once dominated Europe under the Habsburg dynasty, the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918 left it as a rump state, both divided within and unable to resist integration into Hitler's Germany. Austria's peculiar situation during the Second World War resulted in its establishment as a neutral buffer state between the East and West, where it found itself as a bridge between the two. It succeeded in building a new identity for itself as a beautiful neutral land that fell first victim to the Nazis. 
yet it remained as a facade for a nation unwilling to confront its past. More recently, Austria could avoid facing criticism by pointing to Germany relying on Russian gas and Hungary's supportive stance towards Russia. However, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has exposed Austria, which has not taken significant steps to reduce its dependence on Russian gas. Additionally, its decision to veto Romania's Schengen membership reflects Austria's prioritization of its own interests over broader considerations. It's certainly looking like Austria might just be looking to wait out the war in Ukraine without doing permanent damage to its relationship with Russia. Cutting its ties may not even be feasible, considering how deep Russia's interests have burrowed into Austria's economy and vice versa. Austria's relationship with the EU and Russia is much like a Mozart symphony. Complex, beautiful and full of contradictions. Next, why not watch my video on Hungary, the Trojan horse of Europe. And this is my Patreon map. Everyone on this map is a legend. Thank you guys so much for your support. Cheer Perspective, out.